Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Shelton Woods. I'm part of the community here. And uh, just reiterate what Isaac said. We had a fantastic three days together this week and, and, and looking forward to the future. We want a church that is marked by grace, by the spreading of, of God's kingdom. I don't know if any of you are familiar with a television series that's relatively new, and it's, it's called The Chosen. Anybody seen in parts of The Chosen? Some of us have. It's uh, provocative, and it's helpful for some. It's, again, about the life of Christ. There's a particular episode. They're about 50 minutes long. So this, this episode, the first 48 minutes, you don't see Jesus at all. Uh, he is, it's, it's one of those days that we read in the gospel that the lepers and those that were sick were coming to talk to him, and there was this long line, and you just see he's kind of like in a little shed, and, and so you don't see him for 48 minutes. Uh, what you do see is the disciples, they're about a half a mile away, and they are the whole time bickering with each other. They're fighting with each other. Uh, who's going to be the greatest? Matthew isn't liked by Peter, and it's, it's, they, they're just bickering for 48 minutes. And then the last two minutes of that episode, they're at, it's dark now, and they're sitting around the fire, still bickering. In fact, they're standing up, and they're ready to start fighting with each other. And out of the darkness comes this person about to fall down, so tired, and he walks past them, and it's Jesus. And the only strength he has to say is, good night. And he goes and he basically just collapses. And the disciples look at each other. Jesus didn't have to say anything to them. Here's their rabbi, here's their master, absolutely exhausted. And they spend the whole day fighting with each other. When we began looking at the book of Galatians, we saw that one of Jesus's primary hopes for the church is that it would be united, that they would be one. That's what he prays for. And yet this book, this probable first book that Paul wrote, he is trying to divide the church. He's trying to separate Christians. And why does that take place? Just a, a quick reminder of the context of what gets us to our lesson today. You remember that Paul and Barnabas, they decide, let's take the gospel out of the Middle East and let's move it over into what was at the time called Asia Minor, which is Turkey. And so Paul and Barnabas, they go up into a province called Galatia. And there, Paul goes from town to town and starts churches, about four different churches or so. And they come back to Syria, to Antioch in Syria, and they're just excited about the gospel has gone beyond the Middle East, beyond Jerusalem, beyond Antioch, and now it's taking a foothold in Asia Minor. But their happiness soon turns to sorrow because somebody comes back and says, oh, Paul, by the way, as soon as you were done there, uh, there's a group of men called Judaizers, and they said, you know, it was great that Paul came and preached to you the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. We believe in Jesus. We believe that Jesus rose from the dead and that he died for the sins. But Paul left out some very important elements in his message. There are some things that you still have to do in order for God to be happy with you. And Paul says here, as you've read, as Nicole read, that they were extremely zealous, charismatic, but he said, all that they're trying to do is separate you from, from me. I don't know, perhaps you don't know what it means to be a Christian. You don't call yourself a Christian. Or you do call yourself a Christian, but your life is marked by bitterness, sadness, anger. Um, I, I think that today's sermon talks about, well, why is this the case? What, what does it mean to be a Christian, and we're actually only going to be looking at two verses, really just one verse, uh, verses eight and nine. And I want to answer three questions in the next few minutes from these verses. First of all, 
what are these Galatians uh, turning to? You look in verse number uh, 9 uh, or verse number 8, that you're turning to something. What were they ter- returning to? Second, what were they abandoning? And third, is there a different life to live? What were they returning to? Verse number 9, at the last part of verse number 9, it says, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? What's Paul talking about here in these weak and miserable forces? I could take five minutes here and give you a Greek lesson, but that wouldn't keep you at the edge of your seat. I'm not going to do that. What he means here by these weak and miserable forces is that these gods that these Galatian people were were living for and were worshiping. Galatia, this province, which is now in eastern Turkey, was populated by people that moved from a place called Gaul, G-A-U-L, that is today France, Belgium, and Switzerland. They had come over to eastern Turkey and they brought their gods with them. They brought their religion with them, which was basically animism. The idea that the world is animated by all these different gods, and it is our responsibility to keep them happy, to keep the god of the fire happy, god of agriculture, god of fertility. These gods are constantly asking for their allegiance, and they constantly live in fear. Uh, I grew up in such a culture, and... uh, I don't know your story. I'd, I'd love to know some of your stories that I don't know. My story is that uh, my parents were both in the U.S. Army during the Korean War, and they were both in the medical arm of the U.S. Army, and they were stationed in Fort Devon outside of Boston. My sweet mother is here this morning. Um, and after the war, Uh, my parents moved to the highlands of Southeast Asia, a very remote place. And there they lived for for half a century. My dad was also a pilot, and so he would fly into these very remote places to bring in medicine to uh, help people who were, were ill, bring food during typhoon seasons. And, uh, these remote people, there were seven tribes, and they were often fighting with each other, taking heads from each other. Uh, all seven of them had these gods that they, they worshipped. These, And I can't tell you the number of times that I heard uh, things like, uh, What do you want me to do? so that these gods won't be upset with me. How many pigs do I have to slaughter? How many chickens? How many uh, carabaos do I have to? And and then the priest, or priest, usually priestess, tells them, oh, this is what the gods want. Okay, we're going to kill them, and we're going to have a, what's called a kanyao. We're going to spend three days drinking a whole bunch and eating, and everybody everybody will be happy. Your your kid will start feeling better. The rice will start to grow or, or whatever. You know, there's no primitive people, there's no ancient peoples that didn't believe in God. And, and some people would say, well, of course they, everybody believed in God. They were stupid. They were superstitious. They weren't educated. Of course they believed in God. And I would say, well, actually, uh, they were a lot wiser than most PhDs I know because they weren't suppressing the truth about God. Uh, we lived... Uh, in, in islands that were near the equator and at night, I might have told you before, at night, if you live in a place like that where there's not a lot of light, when you look up at the stars, there really are more stars than there is dark space behind the stars. They're just smart enough to know that this can't be an accident, that there's something behind this. Now these Galatians, we see, Paul says that they were slaves to these weak and miserable forces. And first century documents talk about what it was like in Galatia at that time. They were particularly drawn to the gods of fertility and pleasure. And in some of the towns that Paul went in the first century, we read accounts of humans doing the most intimate acts in the middle of the day, in the middle of the city. 
It wasn't, uh, family life barely existed. People were always wondering, have I done enough? Where's the next drunken orgy? And I think what's surprising, as I read this, what's surprising here is that Paul says, how is it that you're turning back to where you were? That should be surprising because these are people who had straightened up their lives. They were now going to church. They were doing family worship. They were now faithful to their spouses. Maybe they were even tithing. And Paul says, you are no better now than you were when you began. Because all that you've done is you've just switched religions. That's all that you've done. You're still performing. This makes us recall, and many of you, if not all of you, are familiar with the story of the, the two sons, right? There was a father and the younger son. Um, I'm probably more like the younger son, if, if the truth be told, if you would ask my mother. The younger said, son said, Dad, I want one-third of the property right now because I'm going to go party, and I'm going to go a long way away from you, and I'm going to spend all this money on the way that I want to live. And so, with a broken heart, the father gives one-third of the property, and that son goes out and lives a debauched life. He comes back to his father after he spent everything, and he's in a pig pen asking for forgiveness. And then remember, there's an older son who says, who gets mad at the father because he says, I have been performing every single day. I haven't broken any of your commands. You didn't even give me a small goat. You killed the fattened calf for him. You haven't given me anything, and I've been working for you. Jesus is coming back. You can snicker at that. Um, we don't hear it very often anymore because of the false prophets, particularly in America in the 1970s, but he gives us a preview of what's going to happen when he comes back because there's going to be people lined up who are there to say, this is what I've done for you. This is how much I gave to you. These are the rules that I obeyed. And Jesus is going to say, you know what? I don't know you as my child. I never knew you. And your performance, by the way, wasn't as good as you thought it was. Neither was your theology. When Paul came to the Galatians, he said, look at what it means to be a Christian is Jesus plus nothing. And these Judaizers are saying it's Jesus plus right theology. It's Jesus plus keeping the right rituals. Now, being a Christian, if you don't know what it is, is putting your hope only on what Jesus has done on the cross. And yet I still hear people, maybe even in this room, who say, I'm a Christian, I'm saved because I believe. Is that right? I've never met a Mr. Belief who went up onto a cross. I don't know that Mr. Belief. If you say you're saved because you believe, what are you going to do on days when you have doubts? I'm saved because I repented of my sins and I turned away. Is that right? How tall is Mr. Repentance? How old is Mr. Repentance? I'm saved because I've been baptized. Hmm. I've never met Miss Baptized or Mr. Baptized. There is constant creeping trust in us to, to look to things that we do as opposed to what Jesus Christ has done for us. Charles Simeon, uh, Anglican evangelical in the 18th century, he, he said this, the human mind is very fond of handcuffs and likes to fashion them for himself. We see people latching on to things that they can uh, trust in, things that they can do. Jesus doesn't sugarcoat this sad world that we live in. He's aware of children born with physical and mental disabilities. He's aware of our broken hearts right now. But he looks into this broken world and provides life and meaning, forgiveness, 
ultimate reality. I was thinking, what are some of the things that I really love in life? Uh, one of them is uh, I, I really, really love music. I can't go a day without playing the guitar or without listening to music. My staff goes by my office. They know that there's probably music playing. All kinds. I'm going to talk about um, maybe some rap here in a little bit, but um, I, I love uh, jazz. One of my favorite jazz musicians is, is, a, is a man named Chet Baker. I don't know if any of you know who Chet Baker is. Great trumpeter. But Chet Baker couldn't make it through this world without the handcuffs of heroin, without self-medication. In 1988, he goes out the window of his hotel in Amsterdam. I love comedy. I love movies. Robin Williams, he was okay until he hung himself by his belt. I can't go a day without reading. I love literature. Ernest Hemingway was great until he put a gun to his head. We like, we like beauty. Marilyn Monroe was beautiful. I could go on and on. I'm dating myself by mentioning, I mean, I could talk about Amy Winehouse. I could, it's ubiquitous. All these people I've just mentioned, they were all believers. Every single one was a believer. We are all living by faith. You say, I don't believe in God. Uh, well, thank you for telling me what you do believe. We're all living by faith, and there's only one person who can bear the weight and the reality of our faith, and that's what Paul is saying. It's Jesus. How is it that you're returning to where you were? Which brings us to the second point. What were these Galatians leaving? I think some of the most beautiful and tragic words or phrase that I've read in the past few weeks is found in, in verse number 9 where Paul says, but now that you know God, and he stops himself in the middle of the sentence. Do you notice that? But now that you got, know God, oops, what I mean to say is, rather, now that you are known by God, well, what does that mean? The idea of being known is used in other places, and at times it connotes this intimate, deep love. Adam knew his wife, and she bore a child. Those God foreknew, that is, those who God loved, he predestined to become like his son. And these Galatians, they're leaving the love of Jesus. I could stay here for the rest of my life. There's an early 20th century hymn by a German who moved to Iowa, and he wrote a song called The Love of God. Some of you may know that. In poetry, he says, you know, if all the oceans were made up of ink and every blade of grass was a pen, and we could use the ocean's ink for those pens, and if every human being were expert writers, we could never even get to the the tip of the love of God. Let me just note a couple of things about this love. Just maybe two. It's comprehensive. So before I accepted my current administrative position at Boise State University, for 15 years I was the associate dean and then dean of uh, the largest college there, social sciences and public affairs, over 11 departments, uh, over 40 programs. It was, it was very, very large, uh, so large that we made it into uh, three uh, colleges a few years ago. And uh, I, I used to have uh, chairs come into my office, frustrated to all get out, that all the students were all majoring in the same thing. And they were like, Shelton, why is everybody majoring in psychology? <laughs> why don't they come over to anthropology, sociology, history? 
And I said, well, I, I think the reason that the students are gravitating towards psychology is because they take Psych 101, they take Psychology 101. And uh, they listen to their professors and their professors start to tell them, this is why you are the way that you are. This is why your parents are the way that you are. And like a light goes off in their minds of, oh, now I'm starting to understand who I am. I'm going to spend the rest of my life studying this. It makes, now it starts to make sense. We're so complicated that the psychologists help us understand this. But we still hide, don't we? There are dark corners of our lives that nobody sees. Underlying rage, paralyzing fear. Some men in this room, some women in this room are absolutely determined to take your secret with you to the grave. No way I'm going to tell anybody that. It's going with me to the grave. But you know, Jesus knows all of this. I've said this before, to be 99% known is to be unknown. And there's such freedom when Paul says, rather known by God. You know that there are a couple of times in Jesus' life where he reveals to the people he's speaking to that he knows their secrets. And do you, you see what their responses are? Remember that woman he speaks to at the well? And he says, go call your husband. And she says, well, I don't have a husband. And he says, yeah, you've, you're right. You've, got five, you've had five husbands. And the person you're shacking up with right now, he's not your husband. Well said, you have no husband. And do you remember what, what her response to that was? All my secrets have been revealed. And she runs into the city and says, I'm absolutely free. Come see a man who knows me comprehensively. Come see a man who told me everything I've ever done. Early on in his ministry, there's a man brought to Jesus named Nathaniel. And he's very skeptical about Jesus. And Philip brings Nathanael to Jesus, and Nathanael see, uh, Jesus sees Nathanael coming and says, Ah, oh, there's a true Israelite in whom there's no deceit. Nathanael and Jesus have never met each other. And Nathanael says, What are you talking about? You and I have never met. How do you know me? And Jesus says, Nathanael, when you were underneath the fig tree doing what you were doing and nobody th you thought nobody was seeing you, or what you were thinking under there and you thought nobody was seeing you, I saw you. You remember his response? Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus knows us. He offers us his kingship to be our Savior, our brother, and our friend. And Paul reminds these Galatians, he didn't wait for you guys to clean up your act when he sent me to you. For God so loved the Galatians that he sent his only son. In another place, he says, while we were enemies, God died for us. I, I mentioned this a few months ago. I don't know if you remember. I was leading worship, and I was saying how sometimes we're reading Scripture, and we, we've read something a whole bunch of times, and it just passes us. And I, was, I remember reading the, the story of the prodigal son, which I talked about just a few minutes ago. And in that story, when the prodigal son comes back smelling like pigs he comes to his father and what's the first thing his father says to the servants it's this bring quickly the best robe not just a robe bring quickly the best robe and put it on him right now you don't have to go take a shower you don't have to clean up as you are, I love you. One thing that astounded Paul was, how could God love me? I was an accessory to murder, murdering Christians. You know, no matter how I feel sorry for the young people, 
college, high school people here because no matter how our culture tells us to celebrate ourselves, celebrate yourself, follow your heart, believe in yourself, if we are honest, if we're honest with ourselves, this is the situation. If people could see our hearts, what some of us have thought this week, they would want to sit at the other end of this auditorium. And Paul's wondering, when somebody comes and loves you, even though they know who you are, why would you leave this? But I'm going to make an educated guess here. Paul slowly learned the propensity for what we sang today, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, for people to slowly, particularly people that love theology, slowly move away from Jesus plus nothing else. Jesus spoke about the narrow way. He wasn't talking about having all of these rules. He was talking about, I'm, I'm the only way. And I think a case can be made of the following. Galatians was the first book that Paul wrote. And I believe that Paul was naive when he wrote this book. Because he begins... Remember chapter 1, he begins by saying, I'm astonished that you're leaving the gospel and going to another gospel, which is no gospel at all. And then we see here at the end of our reading, I'm perplexed about you. I just, what's, what's wrong? Fifteen years later, Paul writes his last book. And the last lines of that book read as follows. Demas, having loved this present evil world, has deserted me. Alexander, the blacksmith, has caused me great harm. And then he says this, and at my defense, everyone deserted me. And there's no surprise. He's not surprised. He has learned, he has learned that we have this great propensity to turn away from the good news that it's Jesus and nothing else. Jesus' love for us is eternal. He loved us before there was ever a molecule, before there was ever a second in human history. He loved us, and he's going to love us to the end. Because we read at the very end of the Bible, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Then he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourn, mourning, nor pain, nor crying anymore, for the former things have passed away. It's an eternal love. And Paul says that it tempers our fear of death. I was listening to a um, band this week, and uh, not a Christian band. And there was this line that came across. Death is only about you when you assume the story is about you. Death is only about you when you assume the story is about you. Last Saturday, Karen and I and a couple of other friends here went to Seattle to a memorial service of a man quite a bit younger than me, leaving three daughters who... I have to say is about maybe the greatest man I've ever met. Such a noble character. And to my great surprise, when it came time for people to speak about this man, his father got up. And at the end of what that father's talk was, he said the following. If my son were here, 
and saw all of you. He would want to thank us for all being here and remembering him and for the contributions and depths we may have contributed to his life and development. I think he would part with his signature comment, I love you. And I think that what we could do is respond by thanking him for accompanying us on this incredible, sometimes dangerous journey we call life with its challenges and opportunities, with its triumphs and failures, with episodes of bounding joy and searing sorrow. Jamie Smith's book that I've mentioned before, On the Road with St. Augustine, talks about this journey that we are on, this journey that all of us are on. We're not on it alone. We are returning to the one who has made us. And Paul says, God's love for us is eternal. I love what Paul says. Stick with me here just a couple more minutes. I love what Paul says in that great love chapter of 1 Corinthians 13. Now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully. And then he ends with this. Even as I have been fully known. Now I know in part, then I'll know fully, but I have always been fully known and fully loved by Jesus. So is, is there a, a different way to live apart from being a hedonist or trusting in our performance, asking, am I doing it right? Have I done enough? Am I right? Are they wrong? Is God pleased with me? Yeah, it's a, it's a life replaced by Christ's work and love alone. That when we survey that wondrous cross, all of our gains we count but loss. A life where there is this real relationship, not with an imaginary friend, but with the king of the universe, the resurrected Jesus. A life where our poverty of spirit means that we get the kingdom of God. Where our mourning over sin and this world brings comfort where our relationships, marriages are joyful because Christ is at the center of them, and a life where we know God. No, what I mean is that we are known by God, and we are loved and guided by Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Amen. Let's pray. Our God and Heavenly Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who lived a perfect life and was nailed to a tree and rose again. Some of us don't know you. Help us to know that you know all of us. You knew us before the foundation of the world. Some of us have this lingering bitterness in us, this anger in us, because we've been trying to perform, trying to live a certain way, thinking that you'll be happy with us. Help us to trust in Jesus Christ alone, because it's through his name we pray. Amen.